Hey, what's up guys? My name is Sal and this is another Expedition Log. Today on the 50th episode of my series, we'll be visiting a place that's incredibly dear to the Dead Mall community. This mall has been the subject of controversy in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area over its rebirth as a non-retail entity, and now it exists only as a memory. Countless conversations have spanned entire nights for this mall alone in the Dead Malls of Discord server voice chats, which I frequently hang out in, and the mall is constantly talked about across all forms of social media. By the way, make sure you join the Discord if you want to come hang out with me and everybody else, and to follow my Twitter and Instagram feeds for updates and extra content. Links to my social media are in the description below. So today I'd like you to come take a walk with me through Euclid Square Mall in Euclid, Ohio, where I will show you my footage of its last night standing on Earth, as the bulldozers were warming up with the mall completely raised by the next day. And to give you the entire history of the mall, this episode is a collaborative effort, including incredible nighttime footage of the mall's final years by Johnny Jew, and supportive footage and interview material shot in 2012 by renowned and innovative artist Jeff Scharf. This is the entire history of the Euclid Square Mall, from its birth to its death, and its reincarnation as a hub of ministry, and ultimately its demise. But first, a word from our sponsor. A video dating service from the 1980s, showcasing what seems to be their most desperate and socially inept men. Thanks for sticking with me through 50 episodes, guys, and helping me to achieve over 30,000 subscribers. You all rock. Enjoy. Okay, early to bed, early to rise makes a woman healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's why you're wiser than me. It's Stephen. Hi, I'm Maurice. I'm an executive by day and a wild man by night. Hi, my name is Phil. Uh, most of my friends call me Big Phil. Hi, Hi I'm Fred. Fred. Hi, my name's Mike, and if you're sitting there watching this tape smoking your cigarette, well, hit the fast forward button, because I don't smoke and I don't like people who do smoke. I'm not afraid to get sand on my tuxedo if you're not afraid to let the wind mess your hair up a little bit when I take the top down. Perhaps even a, a nice bath with some champagne and candles. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and I do consider myself a refined valley dude. Okay, I'm looking for a trendy girl with a simple smile. Wait, it says here, oh, excuse me. I'm looking for the goddess. Are you the goddess? Who is the goddess? The goddess is the woman, is a woman, is any woman, is all women. I like to have fun. And, uh, and have a lot of fun. Are you looking for me? I'm not having fun doing this. Do you like cats? I, I like to wear bright socks, and I'm an avid Cleveland, Cleveland Browns fan. Life is a playground, and I want somebody to play with. Because I really have a zany sense of humor. We probably don't like to clean the house. Uh, my mother still writes to me regularly. Because I average about four hours a night's sleep. I will cry at a commercial. I'm interested in most phases of data processing. Fire-breathing dragons. Type A, I'm not. Comfortable, caring, and serious about a relationship, I am. I'm, I'm really looking for somebody I can feel special about, and I don't encounter people like that very often, and I'm hoping you're one of them. Please give me a call. And you know that a journey always begins with the first step. Fire-breathing dragons. And I hope that if you like what I'm trying to say, or you'd like to know more about me, to please write. In 1929, the Chase Brass and Copper Company opened their first Midwestern plant in Euclid, Ohio. Right there, that's where the location was. Chase Brass and Copper was a central figure in the production of materials used in World War II, having produced over 50 million cartridge cases, small rifle rounds, mortar components, and even parts used to build the atomic bomb. The mill was shut down, however, during the throes of a steel workers union strike in 1973. Then Cleveland area brothers Richard and David Jacobs, along with Dominic Visconti, who created the Jacobs, Visconti and Jacobs group in 1955, were eyeing the vacant brass and copper mill as their site on which to build a new enclosed shopping mall. They purchased the lot and set plans to build their mall. However, they faced zoning restrictions throughout late 1973 into the next year. 
and a lawsuit was ultimately dismissed by Cuyahoga County Police Court on July 19, 1974. The brass and copper mill was demolished in 1975, and upon becoming pad ready, construction began on the mall in early 1976. The entire project would cost the developers $37 million to complete. The Euclid Square Mall opened on Wednesday, March 2nd, 1977, with Higby's and the May Company serving as the senior anchors, along with over 90 in-line tenants, and serving as out-parcel tenants were Toys R Us, a Red Lobster restaurant, two banks, and a stop-and-shop grocery store. The mall opened with great success, at nearly 100% occupancy, and Darth Vader himself even helped to celebrate the grand opening ceremony. He remained civil and even restrained himself from force choking anyone in the ribbon cutting ceremony and celebration. This is the first bit of footage shot by Jeff Scharf back in 2012 that showcases the former May Company building that was turned into a Kaufman's and later an Outlets USA. As you're seeing it here, the exterior had never been renovated, so this is all original from 1977. But it was demolished by the time I got there. So using Jeff Scharf's footage and later Johnny Jew's footage, this will give you the complete image of the Euclid Square Mall. My name is Rosemary Luxick. I am known as the manager, general manager of Euclid Square Mall. Uh, I've been here since 1992. Most uh, large retail developments, in, people have to have a reason to go there. And typically you find that they have what they call anchor stores or big box retailers. The Jacobs Visconsi firm was known for fantastic shopping malls in the Cleveland area, along with them having refurbished downtown Cleveland, bringing new life into the city. Most notably, they constructed the 57-story Key Center on Public Square, which was the tallest building between New York and Chicago at the time. It was known as the Society Center when it was built in 1991. The firm opened the Midway Mall in Elyria in 1965 and the Belden Village Mall in Canton in October of 1970. They also renovated the original 1954 Westgate Mall in Fairview Park in 1984 and built the Galleria at Erie View in downtown Cleveland in 1987. Amidst their success, they straight up bought the Cleveland Indians baseball team for $40 million in 1986, who would go on to bring the team to win two American League pennants in 1995 in 1997, which was the first time the team had advanced to the World Series since 1954. Now coming back to the Euclid Square Mall, it was only one level, but both of its senior anchors had two stories. The May Company store was especially opulent. Designed by the Cleveland architectural firm of Dalton, Dalton, Little, and Newport, it featured all precast concrete panels with a rough stone veneer and strip lights adorning the entrances. It had parquet floors, shiny counters, and raised ceilings and recessed lighting. The department store even featured a Three Crowns restaurant and a coffee shop, 
The May Company was founded in Cleveland in 1989, and as a matter of fact, the downtown Cleveland May Company headquarters building was placed on the United States National Register of Historic Places in 1974. On December 4th, 1984, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company purchased the mall from Jacobs in Visconsin for an undisclosed amount. If I had to guess, it was for about $20 million, given the mall's construction costs. Now on the same day, the Centennial Equities Corporation out of New York purchased the May Company and the Higby's Anchor Spaces, along with the Red Lobster Restaurant Out Parcel. In 1988, Dillard's department stores purchased a one-half interest stake in the Higby Company in a joint venture with famed real estate developer Eddie J. DeBartolo. And by 1992, Dillard's purchased the remaining stake in the company and changed all Higby mastheads to Dillard's, including the grand reopening of the Euclid Square Mall Dillard's location. It was also in 1992 that the patron saint of Euclid Square Mall, Rosemary Luxick, would come on board to the mall management team. She would be emphasizing her efforts on leasing vacant spaces and running day-to-day -day mall operations. She would be the key to Euclid surviving for as long as it did, and she was an absolute sweetheart and loved incredibly in her family and among the community. On January 1st, 1993, the May Company was merged into Kaufman's, who were based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So along with all of the remaining May Company branded stores, the Euclid Square Mall location became a Kaufman's. We'll be taking a tour inside of that learners a bit later, along with a glimpse back to 2012 into how this space was reused as a lifestyle center and training outlet for the community. Stay tuned for that. Damien Zemias, head of the Zemias Realty Group, purchased the mall for $16 million in 1997 from the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. At the time, the mall was starting to struggle at 64% occupancy, but it was still anchored by Dillard's and Kaufman's. However, in January of 1998, Kaufman's announced that it would be leaving the Euclid Square Mall to relocate its store to the Richmond Town Square Mall. The Richmond Town Square Mall when it was built and up until its renovation was dark, small, dimly lit, and it just looked terrible. But in 1998, it was undergoing a $70 million renovation. So Kaufman's decided to get out of the Euclid Square Mall and head over to Richmond Town Square Mall. The Euclid location was shuttered by November of 1998. Now, due to the loss of the Kaufman's, there was no way for mall management to fulfill the leasing agreement for remaining tenants at Euclid Square Mall. The agreement stipulated that there needed to be two senior anchors open at the mall in order for management to offer a space to lease. So with only one anchor, the Dillards, Rosemary and her team began the difficult conversations with the remaining tenants to give notices of closure, and thus began the decline of Euclid Square Mall. It was also at this time that Damien Zemias proposed redeveloping the mall into an outdoor retail center, completely demolishing it and rebuilding a strip mall atop the ruins.
At the turn of the millennium, the mall was declining rapidly, and it was time for Zemias to unload the property. Haywood Wichard of Raleigh, North Carolina, purchased the mall for $2 million from Damien Zemias. But the mall was at its point of death, and by 2001, it was sitting at a grim 13% occupancy, which included the Dillards. The mall would pass through another owner yet again when Ted Lichko purchased the property from Haywood Wichard for $1.85 million on March 24, 2004. Mr. Lichko had been frequenting the mall, speaking with the select few remaining tenants and assessing both the tenants and the community's needs. He had also previously purchased the former Kaufman's anchor space, and later in 2004, it was converted into a store called Outlets USA, which was a multi-vendor outlet center where vendors could rent space to sell their wares. Outlets USA would last less than two years, and the space was again shuttered by 2006. Right now we're walking back in the service corridors of what's left in the Euclid Square Mall. And this was what seems to be the maintenance office. As you'll see in just a moment, the gentleman that was running the maintenance operations here at Euclid Square Mall had an affinity for smut and suggestive materials, which he had hanging all over his walls. And it was pretty sketchy back here because I didn't know what I was going to expect walking in. I didn't know if there were squatters or maybe animals back here. I didn't really know what to expect. But frankly, when I walked into the office, I didn't expect to see women hanging all over the walls. I did blur it all out, and while my content isn't necessarily intended for kids, they can still watch it. I don't know how current those magazines are, but from the materials hanging on the walls that show the staffing, it was back in the early 2000s. And there was also something hanging on the other wall that said, I love you, dad. So he was probably a very good dad, worked very hard, and he relaxed by staring at those women. You should probably get out of here because it's super sketchy and cold. Look at the ice inside that pot. It was very cold there that day. As a matter of fact, the entire place was incredibly sketchy. There was metal dangling all over the place, ceilings caving in, walls that would probably tip if you pushed them, not supported by anything and there were police sirens, and the whole place was just not safe. And I don't recommend you do this, unless you're experienced and you know how to take safety precautions. We have about 16 churches, two or three retailers, a couple clothing stores, a barber shop, beauty shop, etc. And we're always looking for more. Stepping stone. Uh, I don't believe that this will be our permanent residence, but we will be here in the mall until God says something different. It was an interesting thing that when we first came in the mall, there were several other churches here. Uh, and though they were here, they were not operative. There were a lot of them that were closed through specific days. But there was a certain aroma because it was closed up there was a, a, a smell here but i was just thinking the other day how the smell has dissipated yeah, because life, life has yeah. come in it's open, it's to fresher. You. yeah it's conceivable if you get enough churches in here we have a hundred approximately 100 stores not counting the anchor stores and that's just inside the mall itself 
So if you got 50, 60 churches in here, it's conceivable because with the amount of uh, activity that would create, the number of people here, and it would not just be on weekends, but it would probably be other days of the week, that this would probably encourage some people to put in a restaurants and some other service type of businesses. So it's conceivable, but it would um, take a well-funded church or well-funded individual to get to that point. And we opened the community center in December 2010 here at the Euclid Square Mall. The main part is the assembly hall. Uh, the special amenities are it has a laser light dance floor. It has a DJ uh, sound system, 2000 watt sound, pumped through the whole place. It also has a VIP room, a hospitality room with a limo service and a catering service. It also has a sound board that can produce up to a 15 piece band. And behind the community center uh, uh, assembly hall is a training center for computer literacy, computer training, teaching people uh, job readiness training, entrepreneurship training, as well as how to get a GED or pre-testing for GED testing and enabling people to open their own businesses as well as gain education. Right now we're entering the Learner New York space. And as you just saw, this is the space that was in the video that housed the event center and the small office in the back that they used to train students for GEDs and computer education. I thought it was fascinating that this was the one tenant that was still relatively intact. In a moment, you'll see when we go to the back, that green room that used to have the computers in it and the mirrors in the back here where they filmed that interview. Certainly is a photo op spot, if you ask me. By 2010, retail was still slightly present in the mall, as new leasing agreements allowed tenants to rent space, but not nearly at the same high rent prices as before, since the only anchor was the Dillard's Clearance Center. The inline tenants were small local shops, but the mall had life in it. However, these stores would close and leave the mall almost on a weekly basis, and by late 2010, the mall was nearly empty. Real positive change began at the mall in 2011 when Rosemary Luxick took over as the general manager and began leasing space to local churches and ministries as these faith centers couldn't afford the cost of building a new freestanding church or place of worship and they all needed a place to congregate. So over the course of the year, Rosemary and her team signed 16 faith-based tenants to the mall. And by 2013, they had nearly 30. As the mall was filling up with new ministry, Dillers announced on August 27, 2013, that their lease was set to expire, and the anchor was shuttered just a month later. This dealt the final blow to the mall, and over the next couple years, the mall became vacant, cold, and lifeless once again. I love it here. It's, it's very clean, organized. Uh, I think it's like being in the Wild West. I like these these little relaxing areas. And I, I love the high ceilings, and I just like the bigness of it. It's almost like being outside, but not. The city of Euclid has many empty, vacant buildings. Um, and I didn't want this to be one of them. In September of 2016, Rosemary Luxick passed away after living a wonderful life full of loving family and friends. And just as if her soul was what kept the final breath of life in the Euclid Square Mall, only three months later the city of Euclid ordered that the mall be shuttered to the public as there were dozens of leaks throughout the mall and it created safety concerns. So the city decided it was time to lock the nearly 40-year-old shopping center up.
My tour through the Euclid Square Mall in the state that it was in when I saw there reminded me a lot of when I saw Schuylkill for the second time. The first time I went to the Schuylkill Mall, I was blown away. It was an old school Crown American, and it had all of the staples that Crown American was made famous by. Long corridors with giant planters at the end, to giant round skylights, everything that made Crown American what it is. But I wasn't able to get to Euclid before this. It was on my radar from the very beginning of the Expedition Log series. I didn't know that there was such an organized effort to keep this place afloat. I didn't know that there were people like Rosemary Luxick behind the organization of signing all of these tenants and keeping them all in such a clean and well-maintained place. Had I known that she was in charge of this, had I known that there was an actual effort to keep them all afloat and in really good shape, I would have come out there no problem. However, with only the Dillards remaining up until the last few years, there was no way inside the mall unless it was Sunday or Saturday if there was choir practice or something like that. So I was hesitant to go and I never made it out there, unfortunately. But there's tons of great videos out there, including Ace's Adventures, who did an awesome video. He also did a life and death video showing his footage before and after. And Dan Bell has an amazing set of videos, one of which is his first visit, and then he does a quiet time visit after. So please check those two out. Great videos. This Burger King opened up on January 31st, 2003, along with a few other places. It seems there was an influx of tenants back in 2003. And these places didn't last long. They only lasted maybe a year or two. And the rent was all over the place because the owners and management were just trying to keep this place afloat. And this was before all of the churches started coming into the mall back in 2003. So you had places like The Learner, New York, that we just took a walk through. That place was spending almost $12,000 a month on rent. Now that came out to about a dollar per square foot, but it was still pretty expensive. And that's why most of these places had to leave because they just couldn't afford the rent. So once all the churches started coming in, that's when management decided to pump the brakes on how much they were charging these people for rent just so that they can attempt to keep this mall afloat. But there was really no profit here. Nobody was making money in terms of mall management. It was simply a way to keep the structure from being derelict. It was trying to keep something in the community so that people could worship and have community centers to meet with their friends and family. When I was filming this room, I thought it was super weird. Like it was some cult thing with the chairs around that metal thing. But the more that I think about it, that metal thing is probably just a heater. And the things inside that box were card shufflers. So the workers were just staying warm, playing some cards while they were demolishing the Euclid Square Mall. I don't know. I 
I am healthy. I am uh, full of hope for them all. And um, I'm not looking to leave it, but you never know. You know, I'm, I don't know if I should say my age or not, but you know, you have to watch what's coming down the pike. And I'll be here as long as the mall's here, I guess. While the mall has come back from its point of death once, it wouldn't do it a second time. In September of 2017, Amazon announced that it had acquired the mall and planned to build a fulfillment center atop the mall's remains. While this 650,000 square foot structure would bring over 1,000 jobs to the city of Euclid, there wouldn't be any retail conducted at this space and it wouldn't resemble anything that it was in its prior lives. All traces of the Euclid Square Mall were removed. Demolition began in late 2018, and the footage you're seeing right now is of the mall's last night on Earth. Anthony from Ace's Adventures and Wally B called me just a few days before this and told me that there was something left at Euclid. So I left at 9 o'clock in the morning and drove all the way out here, and this is what I saw. When I left just one day later for my next destination on this tour, there was nothing left to the mall and it was completely flattened. As of the publishing of this video, now in January 2020, the Amazon Fulfillment Center is operational and the Euclid Square Mall is but a memory. I'd like to thank all of you again so much for helping my channel to grow the way it has over the last few years. I never imagined that the channel would have gotten to this point back then, and when I produced my first Century 3 video, which has now reached over a million views, I had about 400 subs at that point, but I just wanted to show you guys my appreciation and to thank you again for all of the amazing engagement to all of my patrons who have really helped to push me and let me go on these expeditions that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to go on. Also to the Dead Malls of Discord family, which is an awesome place. We have conversations all day in all the dozens of chat rooms that we have, and we have voice chats on the weekends that go into the wee hours, and it's a really great time. So make sure you join the Discord. It really is a great time. There's a lot of great information, content, stories, and camaraderie happening on there. And also make sure you're following me on Twitter, Instagram, and the Quite Studios Facebook page, if Facebook's your thing. All those links are down in the description below. And here's to another 50 episodes. So I'll see you in Xlog 51 very soon. Take care, everybody, and have a fantastic day.